Verse 657 All that is taught by the philosophers to no purpose is materialism. Where the realistic view of cause and effect is cherished, there is no self-realization. I sometimes feel a little bit guilty that I don't know more about Western philosophy. Occasionally I see a quote by a Western philosopher and I think that's very promising. In fact, this happened recently with a quote that I saw from Soren Kierkegaard. And I thought that looks like this guy's got some insight. And I downloaded a few chapters of one of his books onto my new Kindle device. And I didn't get past the introduction by Bertrand Russell. I'm sure it's very good, very solid stuff. But what's its purpose? Is it helpful in enlightenment practice? If not, it's, re it's relegated here to what is called materialism. And the next five or six verses or so are concerned with materialism. And we can't really understand this in the usual way. We have to freshen up what we understand by this broaden the usual understanding. What materialism refers to in this context is is to do with taking our cue from the world. Taking our cue from the world. In other words, allowing our inner state, our moods even, to be dictated to by the world or to be more precise by our understanding of the world. And it seems to me that all philosophy actually does take its cue from the world. I mentioned my ignorance of Western philosophy. I did study it for a year at undergraduate level many years ago. And I remember one of the texts one of the core texts was the meditations of the French philosopher René, De René Descartes. And I remember at the time being quite impressed by this, well, up to, up to a point. Because what Descartes did was he isolated himself in what was described as a stove. He shut himself up in a stove for several days if not weeks. I don't know what that was a translation from, but never mind. I thought it was quite impressive that he shut everything out. He entered into some kind of solitary retreat. So he, so he cut himself off from the world basically. And having done so, having cut himself off from the world, examined what he could know, or what could be known. So I thought this was, was quite impressive. This is, this is how you should go about things, I thought. But it seems that within a very short time, he'd established, in an a priori sense, the existence of the world and the existence of God. And I remember not finding his arguments particularly convincing. They weren't really even arguments, they were really just a uh, justification for prejudices. And Descartes is, is of course famous for his maxim, I suppose you could call it, I think, therefore I am. So he, he didn't really get beyond the thinking mind. This was really his starting point, I think, therefore I am. He begins with thinking and derives 
evidence for his existence from this fact that he thinks. And this is really the story of Western philosophy. I'm quite happy to be contradicted here. Western philosophy does not take us beyond thinking. If Descartes just stepped a little bit further back, if he'd isolated himself a little bit more, he could have perhaps come to the realisation that I am, therefore I think. Because the I am is essentially the assertion of consciousness. And in Western thought there is this inherent prejudice that consciousness is dependent on thinking. It is a very deep cultural philosophical bias which comes about through limitations in Descartes' inability to step a little bit further beyond the thinking mind. It is, I am, therefore I think. Being obviously comes first. So this inversion of the situation which is very much at the heart of Western philosophy which is referred to here as materialism. Materialism is about taking our cue from other than the realisation of consciousness. I said that materialism is about taking our cue from the world. The world also includes our thoughts. Because we're not really taking our cue from our from the world, but from our understanding of the world. So this is the bias. The bias which prevents us from self-realization. And it's described in this verse as cherishing a realistic view of cause and effect. In other words, we give reality to this external world through arguments concerning cause and effect. In other words, by giving it history. We give the world a history, an independent history, and we say it is a, it is a result of these forces which go right back to some primordial event called the Big Bang or the act of creation. So the realistic view of cause and effect is once again taking our cue from the world. And recently I was enthusiastic I was enthusing about the Stoic philosopher Epictetus. So this is my nod in the direction of Western philosophy. Although the Greek philosophers have more in common with the Indian philosophers than they do with modern philosophers, or what I would call philosophists, because their philosophy had a purpose. And that purpose, as far as Epictetus was concerned, was to do with, with happiness. If philosophy is not contributing to happiness, then what's the point of it? And Epictetus' philosophy certainly does contribute to happiness because his teaching was that we do not need to take our cue from the world. The world is something that we have no control of. And if you have no control over something, why allow it to determine your happiness? Be happy anyway.
So the next verse, 658, consolidates this. The Buddha is saying, I teach to my group of disciples one self-realization, which has nothing to do with cause and effect, being free from materialism. In other words, being free from the world. We can be happy. On a personal level, although these videos are really about the Lankavatara Sutra, these teachings are practical and I have to apply them myself. And I've mentioned now and again certain difficulties I've been having to do with work and to do with my body, which is still undergoing various tests. I'm still waiting for the results of various tests to try and explain various degrees of discomfort that I've been feeling in my body as well as difficulties with mobility. So it's been quite a difficult time the last year or two. But these days, or recently, even though the problems are still persisting, they might be lessening somewhat. But I'm actually feeling quite good. I'm actually feeling quite good. And this can be a problem. <laughs> I'm not sure why I've been feeling good. Perhaps it is to do with some alleviation of the symptoms, of the, the symptoms come and go. Perhaps it's to do with the beginning of spring, or perhaps it's to do with an upcoming holiday in Greece, which I'm looking forward to. I don't know what the reasons are. Perhaps this is the result of my spiritual practice. I suppose it doesn't matter so much why I'm feeling good, but I, I shouldn't really take my cue from the world. Like I mentioned, my upcoming holiday, although I don't think it's that. It could be the return of spring, which is quite a big thing in this part of the world, where we get more daylight. That can be quite a big thing and perhaps my body is responding directly to that. So I have to be careful here not to take my cue from the world. It is possible that it is a result of these teachings and that my fundamental mood tone is shifting. So this is, this is actually quite a nice prospect. So the thing to be careful about with feeling good is to keep the focus on the teachings. To keep the focus on the teachings and to continue practicing. The nature of that practice can change though because the nature of the habit energy is changing. I think some people have the habit of being miserable. So it doesn't actually matter what situation you put them in. They've got the habit of being miserable and they've forgotten how to be happy. But this is how we often are. We have such a habitual way of responding to the world that it doesn't actually matter what the world does. We carry on with our habits, the habits of our mood patterns, what I call our fundamental tone. So it's great if you can change your habits. And if you're not being materialist about it, if you actually aren't taking, haven't taken your cue from the world, then you can allow your habit energy to change. You can 
be happier. You can be happier. You must be careful though about feeding that back into the world. About investing that emotionally back in the world. Because what in traditional terms it is happening is we've been reborn into a God realm and we're just going to go and get on with being a God. But no, we come back to practicing. We come back to the verses. We come back to these wisdom teachings. We aren't going to be seduced by good moods. <laughs>